chapter 15 is about alter ventilation and diffusion. This is a view of the respiratory structure. So we have above the larynx, what we consider upper respiratory structures, which consist of nasal cavity, nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, and the larynx or the voice box. Below the larynx, the lower respiratory structures uh, will be trachea, bronchi, which will be primary or main, secondary or lower, tertiary, and then uh, the bronchioles. Now, the bronchioles will be subdivided into terminal bronchioles and into respiratory bronchioles. The respiratory bronchioles will be connected to this structure that we call alveolar duct. And then from the alveolar duct, we will have a collection of uh, structures that are chambers, little chambers that we call the alveoli. And <coughs> within the alveoli, we have surrounding it capillaries that are branches of the pulmonary artery. Now, if you magnify this area, you will be able to see what we call the respiratory membrane. Within the respiratory membrane, we have the simple squamous epithelium of the alveoli and the basement membrane that connects this epithelium from the alveoli to this epithelium in the capillaries, which is also simple squamous. Within this area is where we're going to have gas exchange. So oxygen is going to be exhaled, sorry, uh, CO2 is going to be exhaled, while CO, uh, sorry again, CO2 is going to be exhaled while oxygen is going to be inhaled. Now the cells of the alveoli are going to be type one pneumocytes, which are going to be the majority of them that makes the majority of these walls. And then we have type two pneumocytes that secrete this oily substance that is called surfactant. This surfactant prevents the collapsing of this alveoli because there is a great surface tension in here. Now, along with this, we have these wandering cells, the alveolar macrophages, that helps to detect any problems within the alveoli. And then the diffusion of gas happens in here at a very fast pace if there is no problems within this respiratory membrane. Now the right lung uh, is subdivided into superior, middle, and inferior lobes, while the left lung is subdivided into superior and inferior lobes. So uh, pulmonary ventilation is the physical movement of air into and out of the lungs. And it consists of two phases, inspiration, during which the air is brought into the lungs and exhalation or expiration during, the, during which the air is expelled from the lungs. In order for us to have this happening, we have to have connections within these receptors in the lungs and the respiratory centers in our brain so we can have this uh, proper functioning. Along with this, we use muscles, respiratory muscles, like the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm. So in inspiration, the air will move from the atmosphere into the, into the lungs. So the lung volume in this case is going to increase and the intrapulmonary pressure will decrease. And in exhalation, the lung volume will decrease and the intrapulmonary pressure will increase. Why is this change in volume happening within the lung? Well, because it's related to the difference of pressure between the lungs and the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, we have a pressure of around 760 millimeters of mercury. While in inspiration, 
we will have 759 millimeters of mercury, or what we call minus one. So since the pressure in the atmosphere is greater than in the lungs during inspiration, the air will move from the atmosphere into the lungs, and it will occur vice versa during exhalation. So the intrapulmonary pressure is going to increase, so it's going to be one millimeter of mercury greater than the atmosphere, or what we call plus one, so you will have movement of air from the lungs into the atmosphere. Now, uh, <coughs> a measurement of ventilation is to measure the volumes that we can hold within our lungs, like uh, the tidal volume, which is the amount of air that we inhale and exhale every time during quiet respiration. And usually this tidal volume is 500 uh, milliliters of, uh, of volume of air. Now we have uh, something that is called the force vital capacity, which is how much air that we can exhale after we have inhaled as much air as possible. And the, in order for measure this, we have to use an aspirometer. And uh, we have also uh, this volume that is called force expiratory volume in one second, or FEV1, which measures how much air you can exhale within one, one second. And the importance of this, it is to help us to understand if the lungs have a restriction or not. Gas exchange happens through diffusion. So oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged at the cap alveolar capillary junctures within the respiratory membrane. And since breathing is essential for life because our cells require oxygen, we have to get oxygen into the cells and get rid of the carbon dioxide that it is produced by the cells because carbon dioxide is toxic to the cells. So effectiveness of diffusion of gases will depend on the partial pressure of these gases in the arteries and how soluble are those gases within the plasma. And uh, the name for the partial pressure of oxygen is called PaO2, while the partial pressure for C CO2 or carbon dioxide is PaCO2. And mm, also diffusion will depend on the thickness of this respiratory membrane that, that we saw in that diagram. If the respiratory membrane is very thick, the oxygen and CO2 diffusion will be so slow. So that's why we have in both uh, membranes, the uh, or sorry, both uh, parts of the membrane in the uh, alveolar epithelium and also in the capillary epithelium, that's why we have simple squamous epithelium the most thin epithelium that you can have. So we can have fast diffusion of these gases. And also depends uh, the diffusion, the amount of membranes that you have in the surface area. We have around uh, 1,000 uh, square inches of respiratory membrane. So if someone lost this respiratory membrane, there will be less diffusion happening. So for the partial pressure, it is created by the collision of oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules within the fluid where they are found. In this case, it's going to be arterial blood. And again, uh, this is the name for partial pressure of oxygen, PaO2, while the partial pressure of CO2 is PaO2. PaCO2, and this is measured in millimeters of mercury. Usually, the partial pressure of uh, arterial oxygen is almost 100 uh, millimeters of mercury, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, it is 45 millimeters of mercury. Now, uh, this 
partial pressure that, that we saw before in this slide is the amount of oxygen and CO2 that it is found uh, dissolved in the plasma. But oxygen can be also found in hemoglobin, attached to hemoglobin molecules inside the red blood cells. So in this case, when you have attachment of these oxygen molecules into the uh, hemoglobin, you would call this HbO2 or oxyhemoglobin. And <coughs> you can measure how much oxygen it is bound to hemoglobin into what we call oxygen saturation or SaO2. And in this case, uh, it's almost supposed to be like 100%. So once you have saturated, or once you have used all the hemoglobin available to bind CO, uh, sorry, oxygen, then the rest will be dissolved in the plasma. So this is what is going to create then the partial pressure of oxygen. Now carbon dioxide is a waste product of the cell metabolism and it is released by the cells into the bloodstream. And it will be dissolved in the plasma. But also, once the oxygen is delivered into the cells and hemoglobin is empty, the carbon dioxide now can bind into hemoglobin molecules. So hemoglobin molecules, you can see them as, as if they were a taxi that is uh, basically uh, carrying passengers and then bring them into the area where they need to go and then uh, uh, bring more passengers from that area where the taxi now is located. So it's a transport uh, protein. So when hemoglobin is not transporting oxygen, it's going to start transporting CO2. And then uh, CO2, once it bound, binds to hemoglobin, the rest is going to combine with water and it's going to form carbonic acid. And carbonic acid is going to be dissociated and it's going to form bicarbonate ions. And then you will have hydrogen. So when someone has high levels of CO2 in their bloodstream, they will have high levels of hydrogen ions, which is going to be decreasing the pH, which we call acidosis. And the rest of the CO2 is going to diffuse into the plasma and it's going to make what we call the partial pressure of CO2. And then that CO2 is going to be diffused in the capillaries of the lungs into the alveoli so we can exhale it. Now, uh, we can measure the efficiency of diffusion by measuring levels of carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitric oxide. You can give those gases to the person, and then you can measure them in the uh, capillaries of the blood. However, at some point, uh, of course, it is not good to give someone, it, this is something theoretical, uh, for some parts like this, uh, you cannot give to one uh, carbon monoxide because you're going to poison this person. And also, if you give nitric oxide, you're going to create uh, vasodilation and hypertension in the person. So the gas that actually can be used to measure the uh, diffusion efficiency is going to be oxygen. So if you give oxygen to one person, 100% oxygen with a mask, and these oxygen levels do does not go up, that means that there is something wrong with this uh, alveolar membrane or this respiratory membrane. So four uh, problems of ventilation. So problems of ventilation can happen because you have an obstruction in the air, in the airways, and uh, this can be an internal obstruction or an external obstruction. Usually, uh, when you have an internal obstruction, can be something like a plug of mucus, uh, like a tumor that is growing inside the bronchioles, 
or it can be something uh, like when someone has aspirated a foreign body and it got stuck into the airways. Now, this is internal obstruction. So external obstruction can happen as well, like when someone has a tumor, a, a, a cancerous tumor, growing outside of the bronchi, but as this tumor is growing, it starts uh, compressing the bronchi from the outside. So that's one problem for uh, impaired ventilation. Another problem, it can be that someone might have a disruption in the neuronal transmission that uh, stimulates inhalation or exhalation. So for instance, if someone has an accident and uh, it has a whiplash and damages uh, the spinal nerves C3, C4, and C5, which makes the, di uh, the nerve that innervates the diaphragm, the phrenic nerve. If this person has this damage to this uh, nerve, uh, phrenic nerve, the person won't be able to breathe. Okay, so uh, they, they or a tumor uh, within the medulla oblongata, within the pons, a stroke that damage the respiratory centers. All these things can lead to impaired ventilation. Now, uh, another problem that it can happen that leads to uh, ventilation problems is impaired ventilation perfusion matching. We're supposed to have always blood flowing around the alveoli in the capillaries. So this, this blood can diffuse the CO2 so that can be exhaled and the oxygen can be picked up by this blood. So you can have proper oxygenation of this blood. And if you have no circulation because someone might have an embolism or obstruction of these capillaries in a way, there is not going to be any gas exchange. So ventilation is bringing air into the lungs. So you have to have match ventilation and perfusion. If you're bringing air into the lungs, but you're not bringing the blood supply into the capillaries, there is going to be a problem. So there is two possible scenarios then. The lung is ventilated, but it is not perfused. So there is an obstruction of circulatory system, or the lung might be perfused, but not ventilated. How can this happen? Okay, you can have your capillaries normally bringing the, the air sorry, the uh, blood into the alveoli, but what if you have an obstruction of the bronchi or the alveoli, if you have a tumor there? So in that case, you are perfusing, you're bringing blood supply, but you are not ventilating. So this is uh, the consequences of what it can happen if you have this mismatching of ventilation and perfusion. So when you don't have ventilation and perfusion match, you will end up with hypoxemia, hypoxia, and hypercapnia. So hypoxemia is having low levels of oxygen in the blood. Hypercapnia is having high levels of CO2 in the blood. And hypoxia is that your cells are starving of oxygen. All this is going to lead to acidosis and ultimately it's going to lead to cell necrosis or death. Causes for uh, problems of ventilation will be bronchoconstriction, suffocation, drug overdose, uh, sometimes some drugs like heroin can depress the respiratory centers, cervical nerve damage, like the one that I explained to you, uh, problems with diffusion, so uh, you can have increased thickness of this uh, alveolar membrane, of, of this respiratory membrane. Or you can have decrease of the surface area. So examples will be when you have increased thickness, fibrosis, uh, when you have infection because you have inflammation. Also, uh, you can have fluid there uh, by any cause, like uh, near drowning, or someone has a cardiac failure. In this case, you will have fluid inside your alveoli, which you always supposed to have uh, air. 
So in this case, it's called edema, and emphysema is the destruction of the alveolar wall, so you have less surface area available for gas exchange. Examples of decreased uh, partial pressure or decreased solubility of gases will be when someone is in high altitude, when someone has hypothermia, or when someone has been deprived of oxygen. So now let's talk about impaired diffusion. So uh, it is the restricted transfer of oxygen or carbon dioxide across the alveolar capillary junction. This impaired diffusion will depend on, again, the solubility and partial pressure of the gas. So if you have low levels of oxygen, so a low PaO2, you don't expect to have so much diffusion. And then the surface area can be less than usual. So if you have less alveolar walls, you will have less diffusion or your membrane might be thickened by any way. In that case, you will have, again, impaired diffusion. So I already mentioned this in the diagram, so let's skip this. So what are the general manifestations of impaired ventilation and diffusion? So the person will have a uh, cough because he will have irritation of the receptors within the lungs. The cells in the lungs, the bronchioles, uh, might be irritated. And then in this, this case, you will have overproduction of mucus. So in this case, the cough is going to be productive or sometimes you have so much inflammation that part of these capillaries will be eroded within the respiratory tract and then you will have blood going into the mucus and that when someone expectorated or get rid of it is called what we call hemop hemoptysis. Now the person will have difficulty in breathing or dyspnea or it can have what we call orthopnea in which the person cannot breathe really well when he's lying in supine position. Along with that, the person might have adventitious lung sounds like uh, crackles that pinpoints to having fluid within the respiratory tract. And the person, in order sometimes to overcome these difficulties in breathing, he will start using accessory muscles of respiration like the intercostal muscles, like the scalenes, the serratuses, and even sometimes they, they can use the rectus abdominis. Along with that, the person can have a uh, pleuritic chest pain and it can have changes in the diameter of the thoracic cavity. So you can have an increase in the AP diameter and the side to side diameter into what we call barrel chest. And along with that, the person can have uh, systemic manifestations like uh, fever, weight loss, night sweats, etc. In order for us to diagnose uh, respiratory problems, we can do PFTs with the spirometer. We can also measure the arterial blood gases. So basically it will be PaO2, P, uh, PaCO2. Also measure the saturation of oxygen with pulse oximetry, which if it's less than 85%, the person will be cyanotic. That's another uh, sign, clinical sign of uh, breathing problems. Now, not everyone will have cyanosis in order to have a respiratory problem, but as long as you, when you, whenever you see someone who is cyanotic, that means that the person doesn't have enough oxygen. Also, uh, you can do this test like bronchoscopy in which uh, with an endoscope, you can visualize the bronchi. And also what you can do is inject contrast material and uh, later on take some x-rays just to see uh, what is the problem. If there is some obstruction or with bronchoscopy, you even can take a biopsy. Now, usually you do x-rays before any other invasive test. And because it's, it's, it's a very sensitive test and because it's less expensive and from there you can move on into other ones like a CT scan, like an MRI, or even so f some fancy ones like nuclear medicine in the case if, if you suspect that the person might have a tumor. 
for the sputum, you can uh, take the sputum, do a gram staining. Uh, if you suspect that the person have an infection, you can do a culture of the sputum. And then after you have the culture, they can do a test in microbiology uh, just to see the, infe uh, the infectious agent, if it's susceptible to some antibiotics or not. And in some cases, if you have accumulation of fluids within the pleuras, which are the membranes that cover the lungs, you can introduce a needle, obtain part of this uh, fluid that is in the pleura in what we call thoracosynthesis. Treatment, if there is an obstruction, remove the obstruction. If uh, the person cannot have ventilation because he has problems within the chest wall, like uh, a problem like uh, cephoscoliosis or something like that, you might try to help them to restore the integrity of the chest wall. And uh, in the case, for instance, when someone uh, might be stabbed in the thorax, you have to perform also uh, like a, what we call a water seal in order to restore the integrity of the chest wall and the lungs. Uh, you can give drugs to decrease the inflammation. You can give uh, drugs, mucolytics, to decrease the fluidity of the mucus because in many cases the mucus is very thick. And you can open and maintain the integrity of the airways uh, using uh, bronchodilators. Uh, you can provide oxygen if the person needs it. And you can give antibiotics, use ventilators if the person needs it too. Okay, now let's uh, move into the different concepts. So we're going to see pneumonias, we're going to see chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases or COPD, which are subclassified into emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. And we're going to see a genetic problem with the respiratory tract and other organs like cystic fibrosis. And we're going to see ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And I will talk a little bit about the, uh, after this, the pathophysiology of uh, this new uh, viral disease that is going on. Okay, for pneumonias. Pneumonias are infectious processes within the lungs. They're usually acquired by the spread of droplets. Now, these pneumonias can also be acquired when someone aspirates its own fluids. Now, pneumonias based on the place where you got it, it can be classified as community acquired, which are the majority, or hospital acquired. Now, <coughs> in the case of community acquired, it's very common to see persons with pneumonia uh, like uh, happening in, in homeless persons, in alcoholics. If they passed out and uh, they have been drinking so much, they don't have this moment in reflex. So these persons, as they are uh, moving fluids from the stomach up into the mouth, since they, they have very low reflexes because of, uh, of the alcohol in their, in their blood, they will aspirate part of the gastric contents into the lungs and then they will get a pneumonia. Now, <coughs> Based on the etiology, on the pathogen, the pneumonias are usually classified as bacterial, as viral, or they can be caused by fungi as well, or even sometimes by parasites. Now, uh, we have uh, different types of uh, etiological agents, so in general, uh, all of them, they cause inflammation of the lungs. And the pneumonias can start the bronchioles, and then they can spread into the alveoli. In this case, you call it bronchial pneumonia. 
but you can have also pneumonias of the entire lungs that is called lobar pneumonia, or you can have pneumonias of the interstitial tissue of the lungs in, in what you call interstitial pneumonia. And in some cases, the paroxysm inflammation will accumulate within the alveoli and it will cause partial or complete uh, consolidation or solidification of the lobes of the lungs. Our lungs are so important that that's why they are subdivided into lobes. Just in case that you have one lobe infected, you can still have the other lobes that remains intact for functioning. And sometimes it is too bad, but you can have more than one lobe affected, but that's the way uh, it is. Now the clinical manifestations, uh, independently of the uh, etiological agent or where it's acquired, will be sudden onset of fever, the person will have chills, he will start coughing, usually it's productive cough, the person will have uh, sputum production, and then that is sputum is going to have different colors that sometimes uh, the color can pinpoint more or less into what it is the potential etiological agent. But the definite uh, diagnosis will be, of course, through uh, cold chills and gram staining. If it's of bacterial origin, of course. Then the person will also have fatigue, loss of appetite, difficulty in breathing or dyspnea. It can have increased uh, respiratory rate, which is greater than 20 uh, breaths per minute in what we call tachypnea. The person will have also increased uh, heartbeats per minute, tachycardia, pleuritic ch chest pain, and then uh, crackles. So diagnosis is through history and physical examination. Do a CVC count. Usually uh, you have increased number of neutrophils. Chest x-rays is the uh, first uh, test that you will do so you can see if you have uh, inflammation in scattered places like interstitial pneumonia or, or diffuse, uh, or you can have consolidation of certain lobes. Also, uh, you will do, uh, if it's necessary, just to see with more resolution, a CT scan, uh, again, gram stain, and culture test and sensitivity test, pulse oximetry, and ABGs, or arterial blood gases. So <coughs> in these x-rays that you see here, you have a lot of diffusion. I mean, in here they're pointing you with the arrow that this love has been consolidated. But s the fields of the lungs, this is the right, this is the left, they're supposed to look something like this, radio lucent, with uh, basically dark color, not these white, whitey patches. So these whitey patches means that there is an inflammatory process going on. And in this case, I think they're pointing to this just because uh, this is kind of more spreading to the love than the rest. But in general, this is a bilateral pneumonia, which in this case, of course, it is kind of serious, kind of bad. So treatment in the of pneumonias will be to restore optimal ventilation and diffusion. Once you identify the pathogen, you have to give the appropriate uh, drug to kill this pathogen and then give supplemental oxygen. Okay, now let's move into COPDs, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So for emphysema, which is a subtype of COPD. Emphysema is defined as an irre irreversible enlargement of the air spaces uh, beyond the terminal bronchus. So basically, Instead of having these clusters of alveoli that individually the alveoli will be separated by their own walls, you have fusion of at some point of these alveolar sacs. So you are losing respiratory membrane. You are destroying your alveolar walls. Or uh, you can have obstruction of the airflow. Usually the most common cause of emphysema 
is uh, chronic smoking. Uh, smoke, the components of smoke, will attract neutrophils and macrophages. When you attract neutrophils and macrophages and they detect these different chemicals in smoke, they will start releasing enzymes. These enzymes are proteases, elastases, that are going to start destroying the, uh, the alveolar walls. Now, other causes will be like genetics. There are people who has uh, this deficiency of a protein that is called alpha-1 antitrypsin that prevents elastase to break down the elastic tissue in our lungs. And in this case, the type of emphysema is going to be different than the one for uh, chronic smoking. Plus, in many cases, of course, the person won't have the history of having smoke and still have emphysema. Now, at some point, think about this. What if someone has genetics for having emphysema plus the person smokes? Will this make us wor worse? Of course it will. Clinical manifestations of emphysema will be persistent, uh, productive cough, especially in the morning, uh, is what we call the uh, smoker's cough. And the person will have difficulty in breathing. Uh, the person will have wheezing because he will have inflammation of the bronchioles as well. And the person will have a change in diameter of the uh, of the chest. So this is the normal A and P diameter in this cross section for a normal person. And they will have increase in the AP to transverse diameter. So they will have barrel chest and they will have poor sleep breathing because they cannot exhale the air really well. They have to purse their lips so that they can increase the intra alveolar pressure so that they can exhale s without any or without so much problem. Diagnosis is through history and physical examination. Uh, you will do these PFTs that shows that the person won't be able to exhale so much in one second so their FEV1 will be reduced and they will have uh, these uh, chest x-rays also showing problems along with the person having uh, increased levels of CO2 in their blood because they don't have as much uh, gas exchange. So they will have hypercapnia and hypoxemia because they cannot inhale so much oxygen. So treatment uh, will be hopefully to try to maintain an optimal lung function and Try to convince someone who smokes to stop smoking. It's very hard uh, because this is not something that is easy. This is actually a physiological addiction. Nicotine, it's a very powerful drug. So the person will have craving for smoking because their nicotine levels drop. So in order for helping them, you can give uh, nicotine patches, uh, also, uh, you can have uh, this support as well if the person will require it in a, uh, and family members, friends, so uh, or groups of persons who, who probably are smokers who doesn't want to smoke. So you have to have uh, all of these uh, connections to try to help. And in the case uh, for uh, genetics uh, with emphysema, you can have a transplant or reducing volume in the lungs by uh, taking away some of the affected lobes. Okay, so for uh, chronic bronchitis, this is defined as having product productive cough lasting greater than three months that it is persistent for at least two consecutive years or more. Chronic bronchitis, uh, the etiology will be having chronic inflammation and edema of the airways. 
usually the most common cause as well will be smoking but that's not the only cause uh, someone may have uh, as well chronic bronchitis because the person uh, can live in an area uh, uh, or in a city where it's so polluted that there are many toxins in the environment so what it can end up happening when you have chronic inflammation of your bronchioles is that you will have hyperplasia of the mucous glands that are below the epithelium of the bronchioles. And you will also have easily irritation of the smooth muscles that surrounds these bronchioles. Now, when you have hyperplasia of the bronchial uh, glands, what, it, what is going to happen is that you will have this increased production of the, of the mucus. So this mucus is going to thicken. Sometimes it's going to obstruct some of these bronchioles. And the person will have destruction of the cilia because you will have neutrophils attracted to this area of inflammation they will release these enzymes, and then you will have a change of epithelium from cuboidal epithelium, which is the one that is found in the bronchioles, into squamous epithelium. So it's, it, this is metaplasia. And this can be leading towards dysplasia and then later into cancer. Now, sometimes you can have thickening of the bronchial wall and fibrosis. So the clinical manifestations will be productive cough, and since you have an obstruction, you will have more than likely developing of infections within these bronchioles. So that will lead to the formation of purulent, purulent sputum or infectious uh, mucus secretions, and then you will have difficulty in breathing, adventitious lung sounds like crackles, the person will have hypoxemia and hypercapnia because he will have obstruction of the bronchial, so no air will reach into the alveoli, and then the person will have cyanosis. Diagnosis is through history and physical examination. The person will tell, you know what, I have been having this uh, chronic cough or cough for more than uh, three months uh, in two consecutive years, and then uh, you will start doing your AVGs, uh, your PFTs, pulse oximeter, and then uh, you will have a culture analysis of your sputum through gra gram staining. Treatment, smoking cessation, pulmonary rehabilitation, give bronchodilators, uh, give anti-inflammatory drugs like steroid, steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, mucolytic agents to reduce the thickness of the uh, of the mucus and supplemental oxygen. Okay, now for asthma. Asthma is part of the COPD. Asthma is defined as the intermittent or persistent area obstruction due to hyperresponsiveness of the bronchial tree, chronic inflammation, bronchoconstriction, or excess mucus production. Asthma is subdivided into intrinsic and extrinsic. The most common type will be extrinsic. And this happens uh, usually in early stages of life. Intrinsic is called winter uh, asthma. It happens in adults. And independently of the classification, they all share all these four common uh, things. So you have hyperresponsiveness of the bronchi, you have chronic inflammation that is going to lead to bronchoconstriction and excess of mucus production. In the case of extrinsic asthma, you have an exposure to an allergen. It can be any allergen that you are allergic to, it can be pollen, it can be dander, dust, etc. When this allergen binds to mast cells, the IgE, in mast cells to neighboring IgE molecules and it cross bind them, you have the granulation of these granules within the mast cells that are filled with histamine, 
and all other chemical mediators of inflammation. This is going to lead to irritation of the smooth muscle cells within the bronchioles and it's going to lead to bronchospasm. When you have bronchospasm, you have reduction of air coming into your alveoli. And you will have also irritation of the glands that are located within the submucosa of the bronchioles. And this is going to lead to overproduction of these mucus, which are going to reach into the lumen of the bronchioles and it's going to form a plug. That is going to lead to more obstruction. So with that, you will have edema, you have epithelial injury, and then your cilia won't be able to get rid of all of these mucus. So this is a diagram showing you the normal structures of a bronchial. So in here you have the epithelium, and then you will have these blood vessels in here together with these glands that are in here. And whenever you have this allergen and this degranulation of the mast cells in here, in this airway, you will have irritation of these smooth muscles. So you will have bronchoconstriction. Along with that, these glands that are located in here will start overproducing mucus that are going to fill this reduced lumen because of the bronchoconstriction, and then very little air can come in to the alveoli. And this is not the only problem. So air can still come in, but since you have to make this air to be exhaled through a narrow lumen, you will have one of the classical clinical manifestations of asthma, which is wheezing. So clinical manifestations of asthma will be wheezing, tachypnea, dyspnea, and coughing. The person will have a sensation of suffocation, so you have chest tightness. And because of this sensation of suffocation, the person is going to be anxious, and you will have excessive sputum production. So diagnosis is through history and physical examination, so you can uh, tell uh, what is the allergen that is causing the problem, also what is the subclassification of asthma. You will do these PFTs to see uh, what is the degree of obstruction. And also uh, these PFTs can be used to see how well the person is responding to the bronchodilators that uh, the, the doctor is given. And then you will measure AVGs in which basically the person will have uh, low levels of PaO2 and high levels of PA PaCO2, pulse oximetry which shows you that the person will have reduced saturation of uh, hemoglobin with oxygen, chest x-rays uh, to see just in case that you have any obstruction or sorry any uh, co-infection like pneumonia and uh, a spirometer which is going to basically sp a spirometer uh, is going to be part of the PFTs spirometry treatment monitor lung function control environmental triggers uh, give uh, pharmacological therapy like uh, stabilizers of the membrane of the mast cells antihistaminic drugs bronchodilators, steroid drugs to reduce inflammation, and uh, give education to the patient and the family because this is a medical emergency. When you have an asthmatic attack, the person actually can have severe hypoxia that the person can even die. So uh, many of, of these uh, asthmatic patients know about it. Okay, now for cystic fibrosis or CF. This is a uh, condition of the exocrine glands. And this is inherited through autosomal recessive manner. 
The problem is in one gene that is called the cystic fibrosis from membrane receptor. This gene that it is mutated is located within chromosome number seven. And what is going to affect is going to be a channel in the epithelial membrane of exocrine glands that is called the chloride channel. This chloride channel is necessary for the transfer of chloride and water. When someone has dysfunctional uh, channels, the person will start secreting mucus that is very thick because this mucus cannot be diluted by the absence of transfer of, of water and chloride. So cystic fibrosis is multi-systemic condition is going to affect respiratory tract, uh, digestive tract, the pancreas specifically also can affect re reproductive tract. And it affects more uh, white persons. It affects around uh, one in 330, 300, sorry, 3,300 birds. So in the lungs, since you are going to have thick mucus being produced, you have mucus plugging of the bronchioles. And similarly as with chronic bronchitis, whenever you obstruct a bronchiole, you will have decreased oxygenation, which is going to be used by pathogenic bacteria to strive and to grow. So the person will have consequently recurrent infections and of course, the mucus is going to cause inflammation within this uh, bronchial tree. And in the case of the pancreas, it will uh, affect the production of the enzymes that helps to digest the uh, proteins and the lipids. So the person will have uh, something that is called steatorrhea. Uh, you will have uh, fat in their stools and you will have poor absorption of the nutrients, so the person will have weight loss. Cause of that is respiratory failure, unfortunately, uh, happens at around the fourth or fifth decade of life. So these persons uh, die at early stage, uh, early stage in life. So clinical manifestations will be respiratory infections, chronic cough, purulent sputum, tachypnea, wheezing, crackles, hemoptysis, dyspnea on exertion, chest pain, respiratory stress. Gastrointestinal system, uh, it's sometimes they can have intestinal obstruction, steatorrhea, I already told you, and abdominal pain. And uh, sometimes uh, they can have uh, reproductive system problems like uh, infertility. Diagnosis is through history and physical examination. Uh, the sweat test is going to detect high levels of chloride in their sweat. And through genetic testing, uh, you will find the, the mutation uh, in the seventh chromosome. And remember, since this is autosomal recessive uh, mutation, so that means that both of your parents, I if someone is affected with cystic fibrosis, both of the parents is supposed to have this mutation and has transmitted it into the progeny. Uh, chest x-rays that will uh, show some consolidation of the parenchyma of the lungs and a sputum analysis to see uh, what type of microorganism can be cause, uh, causing the infections. So the treatment will be chest physiotherapy just to help the person to have a clear respiratory airways, uh, pharmacological treatment like uh, mucolytics, lung transplant if it's possible, and uh, gastrointestinal system give optimal nutrition and supply the pancreatic enzymes like uh, lipases or proteases like trypsin, chemotrypsin. Okay, so the last concept, it's ARDS. Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. So, this Acute Respiratory Syndrome, it is going to be a severe 
problem caused in the ventilation process due to acute lung injury. So the person will have respiratory failure usually within one week of non-clinical insult. So the progression can take within 24 to 48 hours after the person has this lung injury. And the person is going to have severe acute inflammation of the alveoli and the person will have accumulation of fluid within the alveoli or pulmonary edema. Remember, the alveoli, they supposed to be filled only with air, not with fluid. And uh, this edema or this accumulation of fluid is going to happen without the evidence of impaired cardiac function or without evidence of fluid overload. Like when someone has an IV line and, and having extra fluid pulled into their body. Now this, uh, this problem is very serious. It can lead up to uh, 30 to 40% uh, mortality rate because it will have affection of other organs if this uh, problem is not treated. ARDS is going to be divided into phases. So in the first phase, when you have uh, this insult into the alveoli, you will have secretion of these chemical mediators of inflammation like serotonin, histamine, and bradykinin. When this happens, you have increased capillary permeability. And that will lead to starting the diffusion of these chemical mediators of inflammation, especially of histamine, from the capillaries into the interstitial space. And fluids will shift from the capillaries into the interstitial space. What type of fluids? Well, the ones that we have within the, uh, the uh, capillaries. Like we will have what we call edema fluid and you will have uh, proteins like fibrin that is going to start accumulating in here. And you will have attraction because of this in uh, this other phase of which is number three, attraction of neutrophils and macrophages because they will find these uh, fibrin layers in here coming from the fibrin that we have in the capillaries. So as these capillaries in phase three have increased permeability, you have more fibrin deposit and fluids like plasma fluid coming in here and then you can see accumulation of this fluid in here. And because of this, you will increase interstitial osmotic pressure, so the proteins as they are traveling in here, they will make increased osmotic pressure, and then they will extract water into the lungs that is going to start accumulating more and more in phase four. Now, as these macrophages that are found in here and the leukocytes that are found in here, uh, they are not depicted in here, you will have this release of chemical mediators of inflammation or chemokines by these uh, cells, la the, the macrophages and the neutrophils, like interleukin-1, like leukotrienes, uh, proteases, that are going to start damaging these, uh, these alveoli. And then, as you can see here, you have disruption of these alveoli. Now, <coughs> in phase five, since you have this disruption of this alveoli, you can have CO2 diffusing into this uh, fluid inside the, the alveoli 
because CO2 by diffusion, since it's going to be found at greater amount within the capillaries uh, and very little here in the alveolar fluid, you will have this diffusion of CO2 into the fluid and later on into the respiratory tract. So at some point, CO2 levels can be decreased and oxygen cannot enter into this fluid. So why CO2 can enter into this fluid but not CO2? Well, CO2, the partial pressure in the atmosphere is not going to be so high. And uh, sorry, oxygen, the partial pressure in the atmosphere is not going to be so high, so there is not going to be any diffusion of oxygen into here. And CO2 in general, it's more soluble as a gas than oxygen. So because of this, then you will have hypoxemia. And then in phase four, you will have more retraction of the alveolar wall and more damage to the alveolar wall, and then you have more accumulation of fluid. When you have so much fluid within the alveoli, almost occupying all the space of the, or all the volume of the alveoli, CO2 now cannot go in. And you have accumulation of CO2 within your bloodstream, so you have hypercapnia, you have hypoxemia, you will have acidosis, and then you have hypoxia of your cells, and oxygen cannot come in. So this is one of the reasons why when someone has ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, the person uh, cannot be helped so much by putting a ma uh, an oxygen uh, mask. So uh, clinical manifestations will be Difficulty in breathing, dyspnea, tachypnea, retractions, the person is going to have pulling of the intercostal space because he will, he will try to grab some air. The person is going to have crackles because he has uh, edema in the, uh, in the lungs. The person will be restless because, of course, the person cannot gain oxygen and the person is going to feel suffocated, so he's going to be anxious. Diagnosis is through history and physical examination. Uh, you can uh, perform ABGs, which is going to show you high levels of CO2, low levels of oxygen, especially during late phases of ARDS. And actually, one of the common causes of ARDS is sepsis. So a person uh, will have a blood culture to demonstrate which bacteria is causing sepsis. So, sorry. So when uh, bacteria is found in the bloodstream, it, it is uh, it's going to produce a condition that is called sepsis. And uh, the person uh, will have to have a chest x-rays, which is going to demonstrate these uh, liquids inside the alveoli. Treatment will be remove the causative factor, like if the person has uh, sepsis, give the appropriate antibiotics. Sometimes ARDS, uh, like in the case of adult ARDS, is going to be uh, caused by inhalation of toxic gases like uh, chlorine gas. So of course, uh, the person has to be removed from the area where inhale this gas. and no matter what, uh, you will still uh, try to give the person 100% oxygen and uh, give mechanical ventilation. Okay, so uh, before then we end. Um, <coughs> acute respiratory distress syndrome, we have uh, two subtypes. We have the adult, which is the one that we talk about in here. But we also have in children, in neonates. Uh, this can happen in neonates due to the lack of production of surfactant. So type two pneumocytes produces this oily substance, this surfactant, 
that prevents the atelectasis or collapsing of the alveoli or the lungs. This surfactant is starting to be produced around week 23 in utero. When a baby borns preterm, the earlier the preterm that it will be, the less surfactant that the baby has produced, the greater chances that the baby will have of collapsing of the lungs. Signs and symptoms are similar to the ARDS and including uh, will be the, the baby being cyanotic uh, and it's not shown in this uh, clinical signs and symptoms for the ARDS in, in the adult type, but it's basically the same. So we will have the same signs and symptoms, we will have cyanosis. The only thing is that in ARDS of the adult, you still have this uh, functional uh, or this normal production of these pneumocytes so the absence of, sorry, of this, uh, uh, this surfactant. So in this case, the etiology for ARDS in the adults is not the lack of surfactant. It is damage to the alveoli because of these insults. This ARDS also can be given by a physical trauma into the thorax. A, a big trauma into the thorax can lead to ARDS. But in children, in neonates and children, it can be caused by the lack of production, or it is caused by the lack of production of surfactant. Okay, so that's for all for ARDS. Now for this uh, pathophysiology of this COVID-19. So COVID stands for coronavirus disease 19. They give this name to this disease that is caused by coronavirus, one of the types of coronavirus, because um, that's the way that nomenclature goes. So they put corona, co, vid, virus, d, disease, 19, because it was discovered in 2019. Coronaviruses are family members of the, of the members of viruses that are morphologically classified as corona. Why they are classified as uh, corona? Well, because outside of the membrane of the coronaviruses, this is an envelope uh, virus, there are some spokes that looks like the crowns of certain kings or the crowns of the sun, the corona of the sun. So these spokes have a protein that binds to receptors within the respiratory tract. The receptors are receptors found in the alveoli or other parts of the respiratory tract, but in the alveoli, you have these uh, angiotensin converted converting enzyme 2, that's where this uh, virus binds. And once it binds to these uh, receptors, the virus is going to be endocytose into the cells, into the alveoli, into the alveolar cells. It will be type 1 or type 2 pneumocytes, and it will start replicating inside these pneumocytes. These viruses are RNA viruses. They have a helical nucleocapsid, if you remember, I explained that in the viruses, you only have one type of nucleic acid. It's either RNA or DNA. In this case, this is RNA. And this nucleic acid is protected by a series of proteins that are called the nucleocapsid. And then this nucleocapsid in the coronaviruses, it has a spiral shape. So when the virus is endocytosed by the cell, it will uncoat inside the cell and the nucleocapsid is going to be disintegrated, it's going to release the RNA, and then uh, some enzymes as well are going to be released into the cells. And then this virus is going to use the machinery, the ribosomes, and the other uh, 
structures within the cytoplasm of the host cells to start making copies of themselves. Once it starts making copies of the cells, the virus will release these particles into the airways. And these particles can infect nearby cells, so it's going to spread the infection within the airways, within the alveoli, and also it can shed particles into the airways so that they can be coughed. And then through droplets, this virus can spread. Now, in general, uh, when I'm talking about this infection at the alveolar level, I'm talking about when this virus has gone from the upper respiratory tract into the lower respiratory tract. In not all the cases, it will start uh, producing this severe infection going into the lower respiratory tract. So when it goes into the lower respiratory tract, it will cause this inflammatory process similar as to what we talk in here in the ARDS. So basically, e coronavirus virus infection, the one that we have right now, is going to cause an acute respiratory distress syndrome. And the person will have destruction of this alveolar membrane, the person is going to have lack of oxygenation, so the person is going to have, in the case of serious cases, uh, dyspnea, coughing, fever. Uh, the person will have this uh, hypoxemia, cyanosis, and it will require uh, treatment, mechanical ventilation, and then all the treatment protocols that they're using right now. Now, why in some persons causes this and why not in others? Well. It depends in not only the age, but also pre-existing condition. So if the person had uh, lung problems like chronic bronchitis, if the person smoked, if the person had emphysema, of course the person will have more susceptibility of, uh, as well if the person ha is immunosuppressed. So in many cases that are serious for this COVID-19, it's because the person has pre-existing conditions. And then you can have asymptomatic cases in which the virus just is confined to the upper respiratory tract and the person will still shed uh, the viral particles into the uh, environment and the person uh, will have the potential to infect others if the person doesn't isolate itself. Is there a way to know when the person uh, is asymptomatic, if the person he has uh, this infection with this virus? Of course, through these uh, tests that they are performing. Now, the tests are not 100% uh, specific or sensitive. So there is a chance of having false negative uh, results as well as false positive results. The, it seems like they're using uh, PCR reactions and uh, some, some can, something can happen during the process of these samples. Okay, so you can, you can have false positive or false negative. Independently of that, it is important to follow the directives and stay isolated. To not expose yourself if you're not infected or if you are, to not infect others and uh, spread, of course, the, uh, the virus. Now, uh, this virus itself, the strain of virus that causes COVID-19 is what we call SARS-2. So this is severe acute respiratory syndrome, virus type two. There used to be a SARS-1 that they discovered in 2003 that causes severe uh, respiratory distress and uh, we have other uh, types of, of viruses uh, of the coronaviruses we have like around five and some of them they are confined only to the respiratory system while other ones uh, they can affect also the gastrointestinal system and that's why some people uh, they can also shed the virus through the stools including this one 
Now, what I read uh, is that this virus is RNA virus. This virus uh, replicates through an enzyme that is called the RNA polymerase enzyme. And this RNA polymerase enzyme, as it's making copies, new copies of the virus, it can make mistakes in the uh, uh, order of the bases as it's replicating this virus. So it can produce mutations in the genome. So what it means is that this uh, virus, as it's replicating copies, the copies are not going to be exactly the same as, as the ones that were originally infecting the patient. That poses a problem that, uh, first of all, that can be the actual cause of why we have this emerging disease. As this virus was making copies of themselves, mutations, these mutations can have fall into one of the areas of the viral genome that make this virus to be more aggressive. And uh, because of this, it is hoped for us that they develop a vaccine, but this vaccine might not be effective. It's like what is happening with HIV infection. Uh, HIV RT, uh, reverse transcriptase enzyme, it also makes mutations as it's making new copies of this uh, RNA in the virus. So the person won't have the same virus type that originally infected the person and it caused mutations. So that's why they still haven't developed this HIV uh, vaccine. So no matter what, it is important that once they develop this vaccine, they might have a strategy that make it effective and it's important for everyone to, to, to try to have it. Uh, in the case of, uh, for, in, for instance, in the case of uh, the, the flu virus, influenza. So in influenza, you have a segmented genome for RNA. In this case, for the coronavirus, it's not segmented, it's linear. And in the case of influenza, you have pieces of RNA swapping to each other, and you have what we call rearrangement. And that's why you have mutations, and every once in a while you have pandemics of influenza. But uh, in the case of this uh, genome for coronavirus, it is different because you have direct mutations along a linear RNA. And uh, I think, from my perspective, that uh, that is going to make it difficult for developing an effective vaccine. No matter what, we still can have the choice to, to have this uh, vaccination hopefully more functional than not available and then you decide to take it or not. So uh, antivirals, uh, they they have been trying to see uh, which ones work, which ones doesn't. Uh, I haven't read so much about this, but uh, I, I think there might be some in there that, that they might work, uh, but they are very expensive, as I told you before, for any antiviral. Uh, the, the antiviral drugs, in order to develop them, uh, it takes a lot of research, a lot of uh, expensive material that, that makes them uh, almost impossible to take for some of us. So I don't know if they're trying them for these other drugs that are used for malaria um, from the perspective view of many uh, health care experts. They are not good. Um, but that's that's something that uh, is uh, it's been said uh, right now. For sure, uh, isolation uh, it is kind of good uh, to take uh, up to a certain 
uh, way if, if, if you think about it because you are protecting others, um, including uh, close family members and friends. That's why uh, we stopped going to classes. But uh, that's the way it goes. And in, in, in general, that that's how it is suspected to happen once in a while with certain viruses because uh, these viruses will mutate uh, these mutations uh, or any other bacteria as well not only viruses but these mutations can make these viruses to be more aggressive uh, now it is known that it can uh, stay alive or viable in uh, fomites like cardboard for uh, 24 hours, uh, stainless steel for three, three days. So it is recommended uh, for us to try to sanitize these areas that we might think that have been in contact with, with this virus. Possibility of vectors. Uh, what are the possibilities? So. It is known that some coronavirus species or strains infects uh, rodents, uh, domestic animals. So there is always a possibility of vectors. Let me let me tell you about a few years ago in 1998 or so. Uh, there was this hantavirus uh, strain or or type of virus that people. Uh, was getting infected with and he had e hemorrhages. Well, this hantavirus infects the endothelial cells and then uh, it produces hemorrhages. So one of the culprits there, one of the vectors was rodents. The rodents, when they're infected they, they themselves, they don't develop hemorrhages, but they can shed the, the virus in their urine or in their feces. So many of the rodents, as they were uh, in these uh, stores in the supermarket, uh, they were urinating on the top of the cans and also uh, defecating in there. So when the people uh, were getting these cans, they were getting some of them infected with this or, or uh, not infected the cans itself, but they were having uh, viruses in their surface. So whenever they didn't clean it and they consumed like a soda or they were opening with the can opener their uh, product and part of this lid uh, contaminated the product itself, the person got hantavirus and then he had the infection. So one of the reasons, uh, as I am, uh, as I probably you kind of guessed it uh, from my previous talks, one of the reasons why I'm so germophobic and that's uh, why do what I do is basically whenever I'm going to drink a soda out of a can or open one of the cans uh, to have uh, some food from there, I wash the top of the cans for as crazy as it sounds. Remember why I told you when someone, uh, I saw someone sneezing on the aisles in the supermarket. I just go away from that area and get the product the next day. I told you as well, when I'm walking down the street, uh, I kind of wiggle around the areas where I see poop of birds. Here in the Southwest, it is not known, but in some areas of the United States, the birds have a bacteria that is called histoplasma. It can be shed in the poop of the birds, in the droppings, and then the person can have this uh, sorry, this, this fungi, it's histoplasma. So this fungi can go into the lungs of the person and infect the person. I told you, if, I, if you see me walking, uh, swinging on the street, it's not because I'm drunk, it's just because I'm avoiding to step in the, uh, in the uh, droppings of birds. So uh, many of these things you will get with time, uh, follow the recommendations from the CDC, uh, the recommendations of the state of 
try to avoid public places, large gatherings, watch your hands. Uh, if you are working as a healthcare worker, you come back home from taking care of patients, why don't you do probably what you do uh, as well? Like, or if you don't do it, just take off your clothes, wash them on the washer, dry them, and then uh, you don't uh, run the risk of being uh, in contact with uh, these or well to to be in contact with contaminated clothes uh i wish that i could tell you more of the crazy things that i do <laughs> to uh avoid infections but probably it's, it's too crazy but anyway so i hope that you enjoyed this uh this this last part especially of the talk and uh email me any questions that you might have Okay, so this is the end of this video lecture. Have a good day or have a good night, some of you. Bye-bye.